Hello, and welcome to New Frame Plus. It's time we got back to those principles of animation. So far, we have covered timing, squash and stretch, anticipation, and slow in and slow out. Today, let's discuss follow through and overlapping action. Back in the early days of Disney animation, as the young animators at the studio were growing their understanding of the craft, they encountered a problem. They just couldn't make a character coming to a stop look right. Every time an action resolved or the character held a pose, it just kept feeling stiff and unnatural. And eventually they realized the problem was that every part of the character was moving and then stopping all at once. So they developed some techniques for breaking that motion up. If the character had appendages like long ears or a loose coat, they would have those loose bits flap or continue moving after the body had come to a halt. They would have different parts of the body do the same, like maybe having the arms reach their resting position a few frames after the torso. They would make the looser, fleshier bits of a character, like, say, their jowls, drag behind the motion of the more skeletal part, the head. They started paying a lot more attention to how each action resolved, and all of the opportunities there were for adding character to the follow-through completion of that move. And when combined with the principle of slow in and slow out, with each character easing into their final pose but with all of that nice, flapping follow-through motion on the loose bits, they found their characters really started developing a sense of weight. They would eventually bundle all of these techniques into a principle they called follow-through and overlapping action. As you can tell, this is another one of those principles that's all about replicating the physics of motion, as well as the influence of forces like gravity or wind. Overlapping action is fundamentally about breaking up movement so not everything is happening at exactly the same time. Instead, certain parts will lead the motion, and others will follow. And one of the most straightforward applications of that is the motion on a character's loose extremities. For a simple example, the springy antenna on your Rocket League car. On its own, this tennis ball will never move. It is just a static object at rest. But when the car moves, because the base of the antenna is attached to it, the car's motion affects the tennis ball. When I accelerate from a stop, the car starts moving forward, but the tennis ball doesn't move forward at the same rate. After all, nothing is propelling the tennis ball forward. It's just being pulled along for the ride. So as the car picks up speed, the antenna bends and the tennis ball drags behind as far as the antenna's springiness will allow. Then, when I hit the brakes to stop the car, the ball's forward momentum continues forward, bobbing past the car until the antenna eventually springs back after which the ball will continue to wobble back and forth until it eventually comes to rest again. The way this antenna's motion follows the car but with offset timing, that is overlapping action. For a more complex example, look at all the overlapping action happening on Aloy as she runs. Her long hair flaps behind her, not only following the vertical motion of her head during this bouncing jog, but also accentuating the subtle side-to-side -side motion of each step. There's overlapping action on her clothing as well. Not all of it, of course. Lots of pieces like her boots and pants and arm guards are too form-fitting and solid to noticeably move independently of her body. But the loose leather cloth around her waist flaps constantly, partly jostled by the movement of her legs, but also overlapping the motion on her waist where the cloth is attached. The equipment she's carrying is overlapping as well, and in different ways. The rope on her left side dangles loosely, reacting to movement very similarly to the leather of her clothes, with waves of motion rippling down the length of the coil like a flag in the wind. The quiver of arrows on her right moves differently though. Not only is it attached to her belt in a different way than the rope, but it's also a more solid piece bouncing against her hip. The bow attached to her back is a solid piece as well, and it appears to be more securely attached than the quiver, as it doesn't appear to bounce or overlap the movement of her torso at all. However, the decorative tail attached to it does overlap the motion of the bow, which is itself inheriting motion from her body. As you can see, the amount of overlap and follow-through applied to any given part of a character helps to convey that part's weight and material. Like, the stiff, springy car antenna here has completely different physical properties than Aloy's braided and flowing hair, which also has different physical properties than her heavier leather clothing. And you can feel the difference between all of those materials just by looking at the ways each of them are affected by the motion of the characters or the objects they're attached to. 
And for both the toy car and the machine hunter, all of this overlapping motion not only lends a greater sense of weight and realistic physicality to their movement, but it also just adds some nice texture and visual interest. But of course, overlapping action isn't just about loosely attached bits like clothing or hair. It can also be applied to different parts of the body. Look at Axel's idle loop here. There's a nice rhythmic bounce to his fighting stance, and you can probably already see the overlap happening on his hair, his jacket, the sleeves on his spare shirt, I guess, and even his pant legs. But there's also some very nice overlap happening on his shoulders and arms. The bounce on the shoulders is about a frame or two behind the motion on his torso, and the rise and fall on his hands is maybe a frame behind that. It's like his center of gravity's vertical bouncing motion is rippling up through each successive joint in his limbs. You can see this offset bounce even more in Cherry's idol, with her arms rising and falling just slightly out of sync with her core, closer in timing to the guitar strapped to her back. This offset timing of the limbs is not only helping to lend these characters a sense of believable physicality, but it also just helps to make their idol loops more interesting to look at. And this sort of offset body motion is great for demonstrating which parts of the body are driving an action, or showing where the action's power originates. Take Cherry's jumping guitar slam. The guitar may be the thing doing the damage here, but the power of the swing comes from her body. Her head and shoulder lead the swing, and the arms and the guitar follow. She's using the twist up her spine and gravity itself to whip the guitar down toward its target with even greater force than she could ever hope to do with arm strength alone. You can also see some amazing offset in her defensive special. There are very few frames of animation between this pose and this one, but you've still got some overlap in here. Look how, between this frame and this one, her screen right foot slides to nearly its final position. The guitar drops, and her pick hand starts to come down too, but the spacing on her head doesn't cover nearly as much distance yet. It gives the impression that the motion is starting in the hips and reaching the head last, which helps to lend the next frame this whipping snap and so much more impact. Just look at that pose, man, that is so good. This sort of intentionally applied overlap is vital to making many actions feel not just more interesting, but more natural, because these are the mechanics of how our bodies naturally move. But of course, overlapping action is hardly limited to character movement. You can see this principle at play in environment animation too, like the way vegetation and banners and such react to external forces like wind and gravity. Overlapping action can even occur between two or more interacting characters, like, say, if your character is riding a mount. Look at how the rise and fall of the horse's canter visibly affects Arthur here. As the saddle bounces beneath him, his spine bends and straightens ever so slightly, and each impact causes a rhythmic shake from his shoulders down through his arms. And of course, there's a bit of overlap happening to his jacket and the bag as well. Or Daxter riding on Jack's shoulder is another great example. Daxter's bouncing motion is driven by the motion of the shoulder he's clinging to. Pushed up, pulled down, pushed up, pulled down, just a few frames offset from the rhythm of Jack's jogging. And not only that, but Daxter's tail and ears are then overlapping the motion of Daxter's body movement. The vertical motion of Jack's run is rippling up from one character to another character to that second character's extremities, and it looks great. And what's more, as with most animation principles, overlapping action can be exaggerated for stylistic effect. Check out the overlap on Crash's arms when he jumps. The head and the body lead, the shoulders follow, and the motion just ripples through each joint in the arms down to the fingers. Even his torso has some overlapping action when he's just standing there idling. You see how his upper body's motion is slightly offset from the motion on his hips, lending the torso a nice squash and stretchy feel even when he's just standing there? Plus there's overlap happening on his ears, and his hair, and his nose, even his eyebrows. Highly exaggerated, but very appealing. Or consider the exaggeration on this Zenyatta attack. Look at the way his hand whips forward for this strike, with such extreme overlap on the successive joints in his arm, hands, and fingers that the animator is even bending and deforming the metal of Zenyatta's arm wildly on certain frames to achieve that whip-like snap. Now, realistically, that is probably not how metal robot arms should bend, but it looks pretty amazing in motion, doesn't it? Okay, so if that's overlap, then what's follow-through? 
I find that the easiest way to think of follow-through is as the opposite of anticipation. Where anticipation describes how an action begins, follow-through basically describes how an action resolves. So for this charge blade attack, you've got your anticipation wind up, and then the actual sword swing, but then after the sword connects with the target, you get the follow through, where the momentum of the swing carries the sword well past its target, all the way around behind the player character until they're able to bring it to a stop and settle into this pose here. Follow through doesn't have to be about recovering from a big move like an attack though. It can also be a subtle thing, like how a character comes to a stop. I love the settle that happens when your player character in Spiritfarer stops moving forward. You don't see this in a lot of 2D games. A lot of the time, 2D sprite characters will simply pop directly from their run cycle to their idle when the player stops moving them. No follow through at all. And it's fine that they do, because the snappy switch between states is part of what makes those characters feel so responsive to control. Sometimes you'll see a character with some in-between frames to smooth that transition back to idle a little bit. But here, Stella's stop has an actual proper follow through. She leans back and plants one foot, halting her forward momentum before settling into her idle stance. And there's some overlap happening in this stop as well, with the way different parts of her body are coming to a stop at offset times. The foot plants first as she leans back to bring her center of gravity to a halt, then she straightens up, and her arms and her hands drift into place last. There's even a bit of overlap on the brim of that big hat. I love this animation. It sells the physicality of the stop, and it still feels responsive somehow. It's great. Stella is just a great showcase of this principle in general. Now, I should probably mention that if you study or work in animation, you are going to hear the applications of this principle described using a wide variety of terminology. Drag, settles, physics, flapping, bounce, jiggle, wave motion, primary and secondary motion, secondary animation, successive breaking of joints, lead and follow, and many more. Frustratingly, even The Illusion of Life, the book in which this principle was originally introduced, doesn't do a great job at clearly defining what each of these terms mean in relation to each other. And as a result, a lot of animators can't always seem to agree on what exactly each of these terms is specifically meant to describe, or we simply use them interchangeably. Which is, I guess, what happens when you try to build a principle of animation around a loose handful of different tricks that some guys came up with a hundred years ago to make a character stopping look right. But no matter what terminology you use to describe it, this is a vital principle for animation, and one with many useful applications in games. For one thing, follow-through is a crucial tool in the game animator's tool belt for selling physicality and power where anticipation isn't an option. As I said in my anticipation video, when it comes to making a player character feel good to control, responsiveness is vital. The faster we see an action happen after our button press, the more responsive the game feels. And achieving that result often means that we have to keep the wind-up anticipations for each action short. Sometimes so short that the anticipation's barely even there. That kind of puts us animators in a bind, though, because how are we supposed to make these actions have a proper sense of weight and power without the anticipation wind-up we would normally use to communicate those things? One handy trick is to exaggerate the follow-through instead, using the finish and recovery time of each action to sell its power, rather than the preparatory wind-up. Link may not have much time to raise that sword before swinging it, but the long follow-through and recovery time after the swing help to pick up the slack, suggesting the momentum and power that the anticipation didn't have time to convey. But on top of that, follow-through can also be great for giving the player visual feedback. Sometimes video game character actions just happen too quickly to easily see, and a strong, exaggerated follow-through pose can help the player to visually register and mentally backfill what just happened. And the physics of overlapping action can be an amazing tool for making our game character's motion flow more naturally. A lot of today's games make use of real-time physics simulation to handle dangling objects like hair or cloth, and one of the biggest benefits to simulating those elements, rather than hand animating them, is that doing so allows those physics objects to help hide the seams between our character's countless animations. For an easy-to-see example, watch Anna's coat during this Overwatch emote. 
she finishes the emote animation and returns to her idle loop right around here. At this point, the emote animation is over, but because the physics of her coattails is being simulated independently, the cloth continues to swing, still inheriting and following through on the motion of that emote that came before. During the course of gameplay, 3D game characters are often going to be blending between numerous different animations within the span of seconds. Running, turning, stopping, starting, jump, attack, running again, any number of different actions might be strung together in any order. So having some simple physics simulation on cloth and hair and such can help to make that unpredictable string of actions still have persistent continuity of overlapping motion, making it all feel more right. You would be amazed at how just a little physics simulation on a cape or a coat can smooth over those little hitches and unnatural weight shifts. But even when the overlapping action is being hand animated, it can still be a fantastic tool for adding texture to your game character's movement. From the way Mario's cap bounces on his head as he runs, to the loose, rattling clutter on Junkrat's homemade launcher, to Quill's adorably floppy ears and tail. Whether you're trying to better convey character physicality, or add clarity to rapid motions, or even just make it look right when your character comes to a stop, a smart application of follow-through and overlapping action can make all the difference. Because, again, it's all about replicating, and sometimes exaggerating, the physics of motion. But I think that'll do it. I've covered several other principles of animation on this channel already if you've enjoyed this and want to learn about more of them, and be sure to subscribe if you want to hear about the rest in future episodes. As always, a huge thank you to my patrons for supporting what I do, and thanks to you as well for watching. I will see you next time.